In October of 1992, the Toronto Blue Jays and the Atlanta Braves played in the World Series. Toronto Blue Jays broadcaster Jerry Howarth was 11 years into his career at that time, and like every other broadcaster, he talked about the Atlanta Braves. He talked about the tomahawk chop. He talked about the powwows on the mound. He used all these kind of I don't want to say cliches, but he used all these kind of aphorisms that all broadcasters were using to describe the Atlanta baseball team at the time. After the Toronto Blue Jays won that World Series, Jerry received a heartfelt and touching letter from a fan who listened to him and said, Jerry, love listening to your broadcasts. You're part of our family. But I'm from a First Nations community in Northern Canada, and we don't have much of a voice. Can you stop for a second and think how we might feel hearing some of these examples of the Atlanta baseball team, the Cleveland baseball team, the Washington football team, it's hurt, it hurts us and it's painful. And I wanted to share how it made us feel. Well, Jerry Howarth responded to that letter in a way that was amazing for a couple reasons. First, he wrote back, which not everyone does, but he wrote back and said, your letter touched me. It touched my heart. I understand And for the rest of my career, I will never refer to the Atlanta baseball team by its official name anymore. And same with the Cleveland baseball team. And for 25 more years, 36, 37 years total, Jerry Howarth, as the voice of the Toronto Blue Jays, did not do that. But what was more amazing to me is that he also did not tell anybody. He didn't get on a soapbox. He didn't go on radio shows. He didn't make a point of of pointing it out that he was doing that. In fact, I was listening to all these baseball games. And I didn't even notice that he wasn't using the Atlanta or the Cleveland baseball team names anymore. And for me, this is a gigantic example of community leadership, local leadership, community building. One of my friends, Drew Dudley, said that other than his mom or his dad, no one's spoken more to him throughout his life than Jerry Howarth, the voice of the Toronto Blue Jays. You might listen for, to him for two or three hours a day if you're a big Blue Jays fan. So in this chapter, chapter 30 of three books, we're going to go down to Jerry's second home, the Sky Dome in downtown Toronto. We're going to watch batting practice together with the thumping beats of the music behind us as Jerry and I discuss both his new book, his great new book called Hello Friends, published by ECW Press just this past year, and his thoughts and views on growing a community, growing trust, developing a connection, being objective in the face of bias, and how do you learn how to coach and develop leaders from the ground up? Let's swoop down to downtown Toronto, enter into the booming Sky Dome during batting practice of the Blue Jays before the Blue Jays game, and welcome Mr. Jerry Howarth to Three Bucks. Let's go. Okay, here we go. Hey, Jerry. Neil, how are you? I'm I'm great. I just pressed record, and of course, our listeners are going to be hearing these. This I don't know what you call this kind of music. It's like a jazzy number in the background. But you and I are sitting in the. Uh, let me get the section number here. Does it say? Probably section one twenty five. Maybe. Of course, you have the entire Sky Dome layout fully memorized. Row nineteen. We're in row nineteen, seats number one and three. And we have a little bit of elbow buffer between us. We did not pay for that middle seat, but if somebody kicks us out, we'll be okay. <laughs> so we're sitting here in the Sky Dome. I've just always called it the Sky Dome. I hope you're okay with that. It really is the Sky Dome, but it's Rogers Center. The Sky Dome at the Rogers Center. But don't you? Are you like me that when when a, whenever a company buys the rights to a to a a stadium. It's a bit. I feel like they're. I feel like they're paying for us to say their name over and over again, and I don't like that. In fact, I. I go out of my way not to say it. But maybe I'm just being obstinate or something. Well, you show you're a real fan going back to day one here, June fifth, nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, exactly. And so here we are. We got the Blue Jays are playing the Tigers today. You very kindly with your all access retina scanning full full just full pass into this building got me into to batting practice, which I've never been to, so I'm thrilled and delighted to be here. So in front of us, the Blue Jays are hitting. Now, Jerry, um, you gave me three books. Three books that were formative to you. Do you have any preference on which one we start with today? Not at all. Not at all. Okay. 
So I thought maybe we would start with the, the most baseball y one of all, which is called Holy Toledo. And what I'm going to do, Jerry, is I'm just going to take 30 seconds to give the listeners just a brief overview of the book, and then I'm going to ask you to tell us about your relationship with it. Does that work for you? And then I'll, sure. I have a few questions for each book. No, that's fine. Okay, so Holy Toledo is your first book, Lessons from Bill King, Renaissance Man of the Mic, by Ken Korich, if I'm saying that right, published by Wellstone Books in 2013. Bill King was um, the radio announcer for the Oakland Athletics and the Golden State Warriors and the Oakland Raiders over a number of years. He died in October 2005. He was celebrated for his passion and precision in calling a game and for his colorful life away from sports, an utterly original figure who lives today in the hearts and memories of countless fans. File this one, sports fans, under 791.44 in Dewey Decimal. That is sports, performances, radio. The cover is a, just a giant title written in giant cartoon letters across the top. Holy Toledo, which is his catchphrase, with a caricature drawing of Bill King on the cover. So, Jerry, tell us about your relationship with Holy Toledo, Lessons from Bill King, Renaissance Man of the Mic, by Ken Korich. Well, it's Ken Korak, and Thank he you. does a great job with the Oakland A's at the microphone. And he was actually working with Bill when Bill then had hip surgery at the age of 78 and died right after the operation, which was so sad. I grew up in San Francisco in the Bay Area there listening to Russ Hodges and Lon Simmons on the radio cover the San Francisco Giants. But I heard Bill King broadcast the San Francisco Warriors and later the Golden State Warriors. And when I would lie in bed at night and marvel at Bill King's ability to articulate a basketball game with a quick pace, and I could picture it, and it was so smooth and easy to comprehend, I said, someday, I'd really like to meet him. Wow. Well, as it turned out later, I got into broadcasting, and I met Bill. He was with the Oakland A's at that time, after doing the Oakland Raiders games and the Warriors. And I just said to Bill, people always say, when you grow up, was there a certain person or whatever who led to your passion for sports? And I said, Bill, that was it for me. I'd lie in bed listening to you call those games. Well, what's really nice, Neil, years and years later on the field, Rance Mullenix, Garth Orge, who grew up in California and would hear Bill, I was able on the field to take them over to Bill, who was on the field as well, preparing wow. for the game like I was, and see the glow on their faces like I had when I first met Bill, because that was the announcer, too, that influenced them to really love sports. It had nothing to do with baseball at that particular point. For me, it was more basketball. But for those two and others that I introduced Bill to, it was baseball. Wow, what a beautiful story. And and Rance Mullins, Garth Orge are, of course, longtime Blue Jay greats. Um, you've touched so many people over the years. And I love the title of this book. It's it's very similar to the title of your book. It's, your, it's a catchphrase, right? Like his book is called Holy Toledo, which, as I understand, was the sentence he said, you know, to celebrate big moments in the game. Big moments, big highlights. Big moments, big highlights. Yours is... Hello, friends, which is how you welcomed people to the broadcast after after um, I, I read in your book that, you know, it wasn't just hi, everyone. It was specifically no. friends. Um, so can we talk a bit about catchphrases? Sure. You have this great thing in the end of your book about how you develop some of your catchphrases. I almost don't want to say them. They're really your catchphrases here. Let's sir. Yes, sir. Let's admire that one. There she goes. The Blue Jays are in flight. These are these are famous phrases. I can, I, first of all, can you say a couple of them for our listeners so we... For those that aren't Blue Jays fans or don't live in Toronto, it's a global show. Of course, we have lots of people around here. Some of the catchphrases, and also, what's the point of a catchphrase? Obviously, it's radio. You can't see the person. There's no social media at the time. It's a phrase or a sentence that is the unique identifier of the person. Um, and these days, everyone's a broadcaster. Look, here I am. I'm, I'm a nobody. I'm, I'm, I'm recording a podcast. <laughs> You're an author six times. No, no, but I'm, I'm recording a podcast with you. Everyone's on YouTube. Everyone's on Instagram stories. So talk to us a little bit about branding yourself with these, these catchphrases. I find it so fascinating. Well, I didn't want to do that. When I was in the Pacific Coast League for five years with Tacoma and Salt Lake, I just wanted to call the games, Neil, be fundamentally sound. Signature phrases like that, they, they weren't a part of what I wanted to do. And for the most part, I never wanted to manufacture anything. If it was going to happen, I wanted it to be spontaneous. So when I came here in 82, I went through the whole year. And in about 1983, uh, at Exhibition Stadium, it was a day game, I think on a Sunday. Third inning, I did the third and fourth, seventh and eighth innings. Third inning, there was a home run hit by a Blue Jay, and I said, there it goes. I said to myself, okay, Jerry, that might be a home run call you could use later on. I kind of put it on the shelf. 
the next inning, a Blue Jay hit a three-run home run for the lead, and as it left the yard into the left field bleacher seats, I said, there she goes. And I said, Jerry, that's it. That's you. You're comfortable with that. And that became my home run call. Yeah. My dad came up that same year in 83 to visit me. And in our conversation one time, he said, Jerry, maybe when you're at the microphone and the Blue Jays score first, you could have the Blue Jays in flight. I said, Dad, I'm going to do that for the rest of my career for you. Aww. And I did. So that was really special for me to have my dad, who loves sports, be part of my broadcast. So that the, every time the Blue Jays scored their first run of the game. If I was at the microphone. So, so in the home opener of this season, you would not have said that at all because no. they didn't score. <laughs> but you would say the Blue Jays are in flight. If, if I was at the microphone at the mic. and they scored their first run of the game. Right. That could be a leadoff home run in the first inning or it could be whatever. Would and you say that for a walk-off home run in the bottom of the ninth? If no, was, I already if, said it. If it was one, if they won one nothing, like when if they scored their first run, and I know I'm being, I'm just being, I'm curious. If they scored their first run of the game in the bottom of the ninth to win one nothing, you've got the there she goes call. Do you also throw in their in flight at any point? I think Neil, as you talk about that, I think there were a couple of occasions where I might say. There she goes. The Blue Jays are definitely in flight as they win this one one to nothing. Yes, there you go. I believe I did that a few times. And is it is it is it every baseball announcer has a has a home run call that they're known for that they develop? This is like a it's like an outfit that you wear. It's 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 how like I said, you're not you can't see the person. You know, all we've got is the voice. I end every single um, chapter of this show by saying, "You are what you eat, and you are what you read." Like, that's my, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working. Yes. I'm just trying learning from you. Well, I always tell broadcasters, be yourself. Mm. So I can't really answer that. I think every announcer has to be comfortable in who they are, how they come across. Some are a little bit more passionate than others. Some are calm. I always felt that I was just kind of calm and went with the flow. There were moments where you could get excited, but not, for me, overly excited. Other broadcasters get overly excited on a lot of different plays, and that's okay. Because you have to be who you are. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a great way to look at it. So this is Book Holy to the is all about baseball. Baseball is, of course, super well-known for traditions. I saw something on the Internet the other day that said, traditions are peer pressure from dead people, which I thought was a little bit interesting. But in general in life, you know, there's this thesis that, like, you know, are we following traditions for the right reason? Or are we just, like, baseball has so many traditions. Are there traditions that are important to keep for baseball? Um, some people say you have more trust when you have less rules. Baseball has a lot of unwritten rules. If the pitcher on that team hits my player, then the next inning watch out because we might hit that player. And then the umpire says warnings. What traditions is it impor important for baseball to maybe shed or lose? And are there any traditions that you think are important for baseball to keep as it evolves over the next few years and decades? Well, I would say a couple things. One... Forget the pitch clock. I know baseball in general doesn't need a pitch clock. When you come to a game, there's no time clock. It's not like a Leafs game where there are three periods and then maybe an overtime. It's not like basketball where the same thing. You have four quarters and, a, and an overtime perhaps. No. You come out here, you might be here for two and a half hours or you might be here for five hours. Right. So let the game come to you. And there's no sense having a pitcher look over his shoulder at a 20-second pitch clock. So I'm really not in favor of that. The other thing is, don't look at an automated home plate. Uh, let the umpires call the games. Are they going to make some mistakes? Yes, but I've often said too, in my 36 years, I never saw the Blue Jays lose a game because of an umpire's call or a strike or a ball not made because of the other eight innings where they had ample opportunities to win that game. Umpires are human too. I got to know them very well in my career. So I think that's another part of the game too. Keep the strike zone where it is. Look for opportunities to try to enhance it, but don't go automated on it. Yeah. These are great rules when it comes to great, great thoughts on the traditions around the rules. One thing I was looking at um, is, because I, I mentioned a couple times at the home opener, I brought my son. And, you know, when they when they do the home opener, they line, and I'm, I'm using my hand, of course, nobody can see me, but they line up the entire third base line with every single member of the Blue Jays. All the starters who people know or know some of them, all the bench players, all the utility players, all the coaches, all the trainers. There's like something like 50 people up there. And so I'm getting a hot dog with my son, who, by the way, came to the game specifically for two hot dogs, which he ate. That's all he wanted, two hot dogs. Huh. Um, and suddenly in the middle of announcing kind of all the training staff, there, there's a huge cheer. And I looked around. I said, what was that for? And a woman next to me says, she's a woman. 
She's a woman. The Blue Jays have one of the first female head trainers in baseball. And I thought, that's interesting. So there's this, there's this, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Like, will we have female umpires? Will we have more, you know, do you think we'll ever see female players in the MLB? Um, NHL has experimented. Uh, I think, remember, they had, a, they had a, a female goaltender, right, in the NHL. And the other thing I noticed um, is that there's 864 players on the Major League Baseball roster right now, and zero are publicly homosexual or gay. And very few players over the years, it said, I looked it up, Glenn Burke in the 70s was the first ever gay MLB player, but he didn't come out till afterwards, and he told the New York Times, you know, prejudice drove me out of baseball, I wasn't changing, prejudice won out. But these, you know, zero, and that's not baseball, it's sports. Sports is a primarily heterosexual culture. The world isn't, but baseball is. And uh, in sports often is. I'm, I'm curious, like, do you see, you know, as the world evolves pretty quickly here, you know, baseball can kind of feel a bit behind. Is, is, it, is it important to keep it that way? Why don't we see more players come out? Um, I don't know. How do you think that's going to evolve over the next few years? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I think, yeah. like anything else, when it's the right time, it'll happen. Yeah. I would highlight here Nikki Huffman, who's the Blue Jays trainer, as you right. mentioned, yeah. from Duke University. And she did such a great job with Marcus Stroman. And then that alerted the Blue Jays to how good she was. So I'm really glad that she's here. She's a real pioneer, too. I think she's just the second professional trainer, a woman in uh, professional sports. Right, that's it. Second which is trainer. terrific. Yeah. I'm happy for her. And someday there might be a, a woman umpire. As far as a player, a woman player, if they're that good and they go through the channels and the systems like everybody else, maybe that could right. happen. But it right. might be, that might be pretty remote as, far, as opposed to the other two situations. No, I know. I know what you mean. But I, I, I'm just so curious because it just sort of feels like, you know, um, I, 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 what I've seen in basketball, and I, I think it's a lot of it's due to the commissioners. He's encouraged the players to speak out, to be themselves, to have their Twitter accounts, to speak politically. And he says the more intimacy our players have, with their identity and with our fans, the tighter the fans' relationship is with the game. And I've always found, and this is gonna sound maybe a bit critical of baseball players, but I'm like, they're very straight-faced. They're very like, I, you know, uh, it's about being stoic almost, as opposed to like a basketball player. Or think of the NFL, touchstone dances, touchstone celebrations. I know Batista's kind of kicked off a movement about bat flips and stuff, but to me it's like, there's an excitement level in baseball that you see in the fans that the players they're pretty, they're pretty like zoned in. I wonder if you're going to see more like celebration type thing, more vivaciousness, more, maybe that's just what I want. But baseball has kind of always been kind of stoked. You got to be like straight faced. Well, it's a business, number one. And number two, <laughs> uh, when Bautista hit the seventh inning home run, the bat flip home run, yeah. the Blue Jays were all out in front of the dugout celebrating. So there are moments yeah. where the old traditions have been torn down too. Yeah, I love that. And that, and that's why we love that moment, because they're all running up and down the sidelines, hugging each other. That's what you want to see, right? Yes. And you think about that in football. Okay, so let's move on to your second book now. I've got a few here. Um, let's go to this one here, Jerry. Number two is called Morning Has Broken, Love, Loss, and Reclaiming Joy by Aaron Davis. Published uh, by HarperCollins. Aaron Davis was the, the longtime co-host of a, of a local radio broadcast here in Toronto, 98.1 CHFI, until, until her retirement in December 15, 2016. This book, though, is about a very sad instance where she woke up on the morning of May 11, 2015 to find out that overnight her, her daughter, um, recent mom to a newborn, had passed away overnight due to unknown causes. Um, this book is about death. It's about mourning. It's about recovery. It's about resilience. Uh, it's about a lot more than that, I think. So why don't you give us your story and tell us about your relationship with Morning Has Broken by Erin Davis. Well, it's really my friendship with Erin over the years. In fact, she would come into the radio booth with Mike, who was her partner there at CHFI, CHFI and they would talk baseball. And Erin's just a wonderful lady. Yeah. And uh, Lauren was 24, and um, it's, it's almost like my niece, who was 24 as well, and passed away. She just said, I've got a little bit of a headache. And she was my sister's only child. And she went to lie down a half an hour later, she was gone. But it was an aneurysm. Now with Lauren, they didn't determine what it was. There were three different options. And they just could not determine the specific cause for her heart stopping. And it was really so sad. So I wanted to read it because one of the things that I've enjoyed in my life is empathy and trying to reach out to others who are in need. And when I reached out to Aaron, uh, 
I told her, I want to read your book. And we corresponded ever since about Lauren and uh, how she grew up and what it meant to, for Aaron to be her mother and what it meant to see Lauren pass away. And now what Aaron is doing is she's talking to bereaved mothers who have gone through exactly what she's gone through. And I really respect that because Aaron is making the very best of a situation none of us want as a parent yeah. to lose a child. And, I mean, that's amazing, Jerry. It's one of your gifts. You know, uh, Drew Dudley in the, in the forward for this book said, so many times during the broadcast, he got tears in his eyes, not because of what was happening on the field, but because throughout the broadcast, you created all these little interstitial moments where you gave a happy birthday to a production assistant. You said hi to an elderly fan. You talked about someone who lost a child or lost a sister or brother. You brought to life the community of Blue Jays fans and people that knew the game, and you had this awareness that it was about so much more than what was happening on the field. And I want to talk to you a little bit about local leadership. I've, I've personally, my interest in local leaders is going higher and higher. I actually found this quote, I don't know if you've heard this, it's from Warren Buffett, and I thought you might like it. He says, everyone knows Warren Buffett, you know, one of the world's richest men. He says, I work in an economy that rewards someone who saves the lives of others on a battlefield with a medal. Rewards a great teacher with a thank you note, but rewards those who can detect the mispricing of stocks with billions. We don't reward and recognize local leaders enough, like you, like Aaron, or talk about the community that supports them. I was wondering in your perspective, it's like in this fray, you know, loneliness is at an all time high right now. It's never been higher. 40% of people in the world, or in the United States at least, live alone, which is never. It's doubled since the 1980s. The former U.S. Surgeon General says loneliness is the next big epidemic, you know, post-obesity, post-AIDS um, and all this stuff. And your broadcast, and I'm sure Aaron's, often formed a community for other people. How did you, did you do that consciously, thoughtfully? Were you trying to pull people into something bigger than just the game? How did you do that? How can we as listeners do that in our communities? Whether people listening are a teacher, are a firefighter, are a police officer, are a cashier at the grocery store. How can we learn from you? How can we be leaders in our, our communities? Well, I was always told by so many people, Jerry, you're a part of our family. We hear you all the time, cottage country, uh, wherever they happen to be. And I began to be aware of that too, from the standpoint that I wanted to be part of their families. It wasn't so much the one loss record, the, I couldn't control that. But what I could control was to reach out to somebody in need. And I tried to do that before the first pitch so that that person could then say, Jerry just talked about my mother who passed away. I really was touched by that. And now I want to enjoy the game because Jerry's going to call the game for me and for my mother who, whom he just talked about. And I think because of that ability, and I'll give you an example here, because had I been on the air, I would have done this too. Umpire Jim McKean passed away. I knew Jim for years. A wonderful Canadian, played in the Canadian Football League, and then went on to become an outstanding umpire. When he passed away, I asked Mike Shaw, who is our traveling secretary with the Blue Jays, to find out if you could get somebody in his family that I could reach out to. I was then given his son's name, and I called Jamie. And the reason I called Jamie was to say, Jamie, Jerry Howard, Blue Jays Radio, I knew your dad for years. What a wonderful person. I didn't start with, Oh, I'm sorry for your loss. No. What I did was your dad was just such a great influence on me, the game, the players. And then I gave examples of how he would run the game and listen and not just get emotional and toss somebody for the wrong reason if he tossed that person at all. And at the end, Jamie said, Jerry, that is such a wonderful look at my dad that I never heard before. And I appreciate that. Well, after the funeral was over, it was Jamie who called me back and said, Jerry, people got up and talked about my dad, and I was able to make reference to what you said as well. Thank you so much. That's why I was so happy to be a broadcaster all those years, to use that platform for situations just like that. And had I been on the radio, I would have talked about that and Jim McKean and his son. Ah. It makes me, you have tears, I mean, we both have tears in our eyes, you talking about that. And that, that was actually one of the things Drew mentioned. He's like, he went on about an umpire for half an inning, and by the end, I was crying. You know, you affect people so so far away from you, and I hope we do that with this show. We're certainly trying to. Well, Speaking it gets of, back to Erin Davis, too. Yeah. The reason I reached out to her, when you only have a child for 24 years, that's something you never get over. Realizing that, what I try to do is reinforce those 24 years and how valuable they were. And look what you were able to do with your one and only child. 
And at the end, if that can be reinforced, the positiveness, I know the rest will linger. You can't get past that, nor do you want to. But my attitude is, I've been blessed with a wonderful life. Let me share what you had, too, regarding Lauren and those years you had together. And at the end, Aaron says, Jerry, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So we traded books. It was kind of like one general manager trading uh, a player to another organization. Yeah. I read her book. She's read my book. And we love each other for it. Oh, what a beautiful story. And I'm, almost, I'm like, is there a root reason inside Jerry Howard that makes you want to do that? Not everyone hears about somebody passing away, asks to figure out how they can contact a family member just to call them up and tell them. Never mind tell the whole world about it through your broadcast. It, it, was there something that happened to you when you were growing up or did you, were you always this way? I think I've just always been that way. And again, you can't manufacture who you are. It, it all want, you want it to be spontaneous. And for me, that was always been something where even priests that I've known for years, they would have difficulty in situations like that. And yet that's what they were supposed to do, reach out to somebody and console and show empathy. But for me, my first reaction was always, can you get me a phone number? And then I would set up that pipeline and just share with them the experiences that I had. Because for me, Neil, I'm not just glass half full, I'm glass overflowing. And that's the blessing that I have. The least I am is glass half full. And if I see somebody who's glass half empty in a bad situation, and I can get them back to glass half full, that's what I want to do. And one thing I shared with Aaron just the other day, I said, your life is glass half full. But with Lauren, it was glass overflowing. So now you're back to glass half full, and that's still very, very good compared to what most people live in their lives. How, how do you become a glass overflowing person? I think it's just who you are and an appreciation for your blessings, a spiritual life that you don't wear on your sleeve. You live it. You're thankful for everything. And really one of my prayers to God is, dear Lord, you take me when you want me, not when I want to go. You take me when you want me and let this day be the best day it can be. And if I'm blessed with tomorrow, let me love, praise, and serve you tomorrow the same way that I'm trying to do it today. It's interesting. You are a very spiritual person and a very faithful person and a very religious person here, but you didn't bring you didn't bring your religion into the broadcast, not that I recall. Was that purposeful? That's right, because I think something like that has got to be personal. Uh -huh. And uh, if you live your life, people will see who you are. Yeah. You don't have to advertise it. Like I say, you don't have to wear your ego or your spiritual life on your sleeve. And so I never wanted to do that on the broadcast. Uh, my... My whole job up here and my first and only Major League team was to call the game. So if the fans knew what was going on, I could highlight my analyst before that Tom and I would highlight the game. And if I did that, that's what I was brought here to do, to make that game become alive so that the fans felt that they were right here in the ballpark with me. And I love doing that. Religion, a God-fearing life, that's all personal. And I want people to do that on their own. That's beautiful. And that's respectful. And that's that's that's... Everyone, these it seems people are more aggressive these days, whether they are religious or not. They're they're a little bit more forward with their views. Um, you know, I see atheist atheism um, stickers like in advertisements on on billboards and buses now. I'm like, where did this come from? You know, people are really going out there with their views, saying this is the way to think. You know, and and, and so refreshing to hear someone who's like, people will come to you. You are what what you stand for. And you mentioned I had to jump on this because you mentioned it. Make the game come to life. Okay. I purposely asked you to come to the Sky Dome with the music blaring in the background. I hope it's not dist too distracting. With the crack of the bat in the background, because I want this game to come to life. You did that so well. How did you? I heard that you pumped up the crowd noise. You left big silences in your broadcast. If there was a home run, sometimes you wouldn't talk for a minute. And through the radio, all we're hearing is like what it's like in the stadium. How else did you try to make the game come to people in their homes? Were you doing things like that? Well, what I tried to do is have ballpark sounds come in. Uh -huh. And there are 29 other public address announcers in addition to Tim Langton right here at the Rogers Center. And I told our engineer, Tom Kelly, uh, Tom Young, that Tom, when uh, the other public address announcers are coming in with bringing a hitter to the plate, bring up their voice. I want fans to hear their unique style, their voices, how they bring a player to the plate. That's a ballpark sound. Now, there are a few times when you're talking about a big play, whatever, you don't have time to do that, that's great. The other thing is when there's a big home run, Bautista's bat flip home run, the next year Edwin's walk-off home run yeah, to beat the Orioles. I was here for that one. Okay, well, that was a special <laughs> moment. Yeah. And on radio, I made it special for the crowd because both those times I didn't talk for about a minute. And I wanted the crowd to really feel at home. Wow, I'm there. I can feel that crowd, the pandemonium, the excitement, the bedlam. 
And that's what I wanted to create. And then if it was too low, too low, I might not speak for 10, 15 seconds. If it was uh, Josh Donaldson coming to the plate, MVP, MVP. All those ballpark sounds complemented what my voice was trying to do, what our analyst was trying to do, and it made for a better broadcast. Ah, oh, I love it. I think I'm inspired by it. That's partly why this, this podcast I'm on is all 100% in person and 100% the location of the guests choosing. So we try to do... I've been in the backseat of David Sedaris' limo. I went to Judy Bloom's bookstore uh, in Key West, Florida. Wow. You know, and because I'm trying to, you know, hopefully, not quite ballpark sounds, this is unique, but but trying our best to get people to feel what I get to feel through these conversations. And by the way, I'm recording it in two ears so that the listener is going to hear a, is going to hear us in two different ears so that they can be between us. Wow, good. Yeah, yeah, try. I'm learning from you. I'm learning. Um, now, trust. Morning. Tradition. We've talked about a lot of these themes. There's a tradition you've had in place since 1992 where you haven't purposely, and I love that you did this, Jerry, and I did not even know you did this. You took a stand. You decided not to use the name of the Cleveland baseball team or the Atlanta baseball team. Um, it's local leadership, like we talked about. Um, so, first of all, I'd love to, if you, if you don't mind sharing for those that don't know, because I've read about it through your book, of course. Um, how did you decide to do that? And, 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 you know, why did you not, you didn't say, like, I'm not going to say the Cleveland name and the Atlanta name. You, you just made that change. And you were ahead of your times, as, as you know, because people now followed your lead. And a lot of people now um, just will not use the name of the Cleveland or the Atlanta baseball team. How, how, did that, how did you become the first mover on that? Well, that was fortunate for me because in 90, 1992, when the Blue Jays played Atlanta, I was like everybody else, talking about the tomahawk chop, powwows at the mound. I'd be talking about Cleveland Chief Wahoo, the red-faced mascot that they wore in their uniforms. I was like everybody else. And then at the end of the World Series, I got a letter from a gentleman up north, a member of the First Nations. He said, Jerry, I love your broadcast, but could you just think a little bit about what you say and how you say it when it comes to the nicknames of Cleveland, Atlanta, the Washington Football Club? We don't have much of a voice at all. And those are offensive to us, those terms, those logos, those red-faced... Uh, Chief Wahoos, and if you could just bear in mind that we are up here too listening to this, I would appreciate it if you would just respect a little bit more about where we're coming from. It was such a heartfelt letter, Neil. I wrote him back and I said, and I think his name was Jim. I wish I still had the letter. I said, sir, I said, I really appreciate what you wrote here. You touched my heart. For the rest of my career, I will not use those nicknames in deference to you and your heart and how you feel about this, and I respect that 100%. I didn't from that point on. 25 years later. All those years later. Yeah. And then in 22 years after that, uh, right until 2017 when I retired, in 2016, the Blue Jays played Cleveland. And Jeff Blair had me on his show, and just before we went on the air, he said, Jerry, Blue Jays have not been in the, uh, Blue Jays were in the World Series in 92, and People have said, I don't think Jerry uses the nicknames of Cleveland or Atlanta. Is that true all these years? And I told him briefly what we just talked yeah. about here. He said, can we talk about that on the radio, on my show? He said, I said, sure. We went on a minute later. I told the story. And my son, Joe, who lives here in Toronto, he said, Dad, you've gone viral. You're trending across Canada and really? across North America. You're in the top ten. And I didn't want it to be about me. This wasn't like Jerry on a soapbox or whatever mm -hmm. saying, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. No. But when that gentleman touched my heart, that was enough for me to say, I'm not using those names because I don't think it's right. And you always try to do the right thing. I'd say for every 95, 96, 97 praiseworthy comments, there were one or two where people said, mind your own business. That's not your role. You call the games. Let those nicknames stand the way they are. They're not offensive. It's tradition. And I, I let those go in one ear, not the other. But it also goes to show in social media, don't get caught up in negativity because bloggers, social medias or whatever, they can be very negative and you don't want to let that influence who you are and what you are. And I have it in my career. So I was very happy to do that just privately. And then when I went out there, I was very happy too that people began to talk about it and say, I'm not going to do that either. I'm fascinated by that story for so many reasons, the thoughtfulness, the leadership, the quiet leadership, the servant leadership, and also the idea that you did this essentially publicly, but incognito for 20 plus years before people, I was listening to you all those years. I never noticed that you were doing that. 
That's right. Even in my book, I would write Cleveland or I'd write Atlanta. And that was a reminder, Jerry, don't go there. And uh, I didn't. In fact, what was kind of funny is Tom Cheek and I called the 1995 World Series across Canada, Cleveland and Atlanta. And not once did I use their nicknames wow. in a World Series. Well, you guys called the, the World Series between the two teams. We did. We did a oh, World wow. Series broadcast across the country for a number of years, even though the Blue Jays weren't in it. And that was one that was a real challenge. And uh, I was able to get through all those games. Did you have and to I, come up with different names for the teams? No, just Cleveland and Atlanta. You didn't say, you didn't come up with the versions of no. it? Okay, okay, mm-hmm. cool. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that story. What an incredible example of local leadership, community building, uh, doing something in a quiet way that people resonate with and follow. And you know what? Maybe imperceptibly, I did notice it. Well, I'll you tell know. you what's really refreshing is now, for the first time in 2019, Cleveland does not have Chief Wahoo anymore ah. as their mascot. They took it off this year. They took it off completely, 100%. So good for them. I guess we can't speculate on where that's going to go in the future, but hopefully they it's change It's like anything the name. else. Let the future take care of itself. <laughs> exactly. You're helping me stay in the present. Here I am obsessing about what's next. Jerry, are you okay if we turn now to your third and final book? It is called Knight, My Story by Bob Knight and Bob Hamill, published in 2002 by Thomas Dunn Books. Okay. Bob, Bobby Knight was born October 25th, 1940. He is a retired American basketball coach. Nicknamed the General, Knight won 902 NCAA Division I men's college basketball games, the most all-time at the time of his retirement. I think now he's slipped down to number three now that he's not coaching and some other people still are. Knight is best known as the head coach of the Indiana Hoosiers from 1971 to 2000. He also coached Texas Tech in, at Army before and afterwards. The cover of this book is the word Knight written in giant white letters across the top of a black background with a basketball court drawn in white and Bobby sitting directly in the center facing us with a red shirt on it. File this one. This is a funny filing system, Jerry. 796.323. Sports, ball games, inflatable ball games thrown or hit by hand, basketball. Jerry, can you tell us about your relationship with this book, (laughs) Knight, My Story by Bobby Knight? I coached basketball for 25 years here. I coached, in addition to that, my two sons, Ben and Joe, in the Etobicoke Basketball Association. And then when I began to take it seriously, beginning my 25 years at Islington Middle School, where Joe was in his last year as an eighth grader, I didn't really, I had played basketball a little bit growing up, but I wanted to do it the right way. I also had heard about Bobby Knight, and I also knew that he was the general. There was no fooling around with him. But the one thing that intrigued me about him was the fact that his players played hard for him. So I read his book and I read articles about Bobby because if I were going to coach basketball, I wanted to draw the same respect for for me in the game, respect for the game and have players respect me too, but without being Bobby. My approach would be different, but I wanted to find out what led him to be the great coach that he was. Because the one thing he said that really piqued my curiosity was, I'm proudest of the fact that my players play hard. They go out there and they play hard. So when I read the book, I began to realize it all started in practice. He ran great practices. He was organized. He had systems that he put into play. He had a lot of scrimmages. He made sure that everything was done by the minute. And then at the end, there'd be a little levity too, where you might have some free throw shooting and some contests. But for those hour, that hour and a half or those two hours, it was all business. And then you knew if you were playing for Bobby Knight, you better practice hard because the next step was to take it to the game and you're in the Big Ten rivaling Michigan, Michigan State, and everybody else. It was a wonderful eye-opener for me to say, Jerry, here's a a platform. Here's a a way to build a fundamentals and a, a foundation to what you're doing, being you, not Bobby, but borrowing from all the things that led to him being so organized and disciplined to get the most out of his players. Oh. And I like that you said, but not being him doing it. Get That's a pretty wise remark. You're looking at someone who, by the way, on Wikipedia, I've never seen a longer controversies listing. It's separated by the decade. There's over 2,000 words written just on the number of controversies he's had over the years. He's accused, of course, of, of, of hitting players and much, much worse stuff than that. But yet you said you saw the gold within the, the whole stream. You saw, hey, there's something working here. Look how hard the players play for him. You saw something valuable within that. I did, and I read other books too, and then uh, later um, DVDs would come out about basketball coaches and their players, but I needed to have a starting point, 
And I knew that uh, I wasn't going to copy anybody, but Bobby Knight was one of the most successful basketball coaches in the NCAA history. And so I wanted to know why. And so when I borrowed from all of that, I could, I could do all the things that he did and yet still coach in a different way. And the other thing is, he was all basketball. I was really a baseball broadcaster who, whose avocation would be to coach basketball. And what did I do too? I went to DeMatha High School in uh, Washington, D.C. one time when the Blue Jays had an off day playing the Orioles. And I met Morgan Wooten, who is probably the best high school basketball coach ever. And his son now is a coach there too, Joe, and working with those kids. And I did meet him. And he said, Jerry, it's not what you coach, it's what you emphasize. Bobby emphasized basketball fundamentals. Morgan Wooten emphasized academics. Every player he had at DeMatha High School, every player went on to college wow. in some form or another, either as a basketball player or a student. And so by borrowing from all of those people, in my 25 years coaching, the last 20 at Etobicoke Collegiate, the, best, the freshman team, the junior team, and the senior team, I was able to then be a reflection of many, many different coaches and try to be as fundamentally sound as I could for my players, not for me, and that worked. That's amazing, Jerry. Look, one of your most formative books is the book Bobby Knight wrote. You have coached basketball yourself for 25 years. You've observed from the booth that I'm looking at right behind you for 37 years. Um, you know, the, the Blue Jays, you've seen a lot of coaches here, good ones, bad ones, ones get promoted, ones get fired. Are there any coaching universals that you've picked out over the years that are essential for you know people of all ages or anything? Maybe the other c converse element of the question is, Anything that we do really well with kids that we forget when we're coaching adults or vice versa? Well, I think especially, and even at the major league level to a certain degree, you still have to have fun. It still has to be something, as Roy Campanella once said, you have to have a little boy in you to play this game. Now, at the major league level, it's a business. People ask me about these salaries, Mike Trout, Bryce Harper. And I tell people the owners are dividing among themselves, 30 owners, $10 billion a year with a B. So there's plenty of money for them to dole out those kind of contracts. The players, however, know that their careers here can be short-lived. They're either here for a reason or to stay, they have to continue to work at it. And so for me, when I had kids in 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th grade, and then the high school kids that I coached, it was always the emphasis on, you're here in my classroom. Your eyes are on me, and I'm your teacher. And I want you to do the same thing in your classrooms. If I see every week that you're not attending class or you're failing classes uh, or whatever because you're not putting in the time or whatever, you're not going to be on this team. So again, it's what you emphasize. And after that, I think when you play sports, you can't hide talent. If you have talent, Neil, you'll rise to certain levels. But still, you can't be an egotist. You can't be, look at me. And the one thing I took great pride in in my career, on offense, sharing the ball, and on defense playing, whether it was a, a zone, a trapping zone, man-to-man, -man, you do it as a unit. You communicate with each other on the court. It's five against those other five, not just one, a star and four others around them who are putting in the time. And I really emphasize that. And at the end, I was really fortunate to have great teams. And one of my best teams, it's in the book, was an 0-19 team that never won a game. But for five months, those 15 <laughs> kids stayed together. We were getting beat 22 to four in the first quarter in our first game till the last game at Richview Collegiate. They're undefeated, they're the number one seed. We have the ball with 254 to play down by six. That's how far we came. Those are the teams that I take great, great pride in. Wow, even though it's an 0-19 T, you can, you can articulate and see the massive amounts of growth that happened over that season. Yes, and these were just kids who were starting to learn the game of basketball. And they did learn it, and they got better and better and better at it. And years later, they would come to me and say, Jerry, that's one of the best teams that I was ever on. That's amazing, Jerry. You know, you have such an intimacy with sports. Um, you've been in a lot of clubhouses, and you've always been this person, um, other than the teams you've coached, where you're in the clubhouse as a bit of an observer. You're interviewing people. Um, are there any clubhouse? I've always, and this is the part of the game I can't see as a fan, but... Clubhouse dynamics. I, I remember in 92, 93 when the Blue Jays won the World Series. Honestly, it felt like you could feel it all year. The rally caps, you know, everyone. There was this, this energy that was palpable about the chemistry of the team. When you're walking through the clubhouse of a team, maybe the Blue Jays, maybe another team, do you notice things like that? Are there elements of, uh, like, things that are indicating future cohesion or dysfunction that you can spot in the clubhouse that is working or isn't working? I think you can see that, too. Uh, I can relate a story to Jim Leland who's uh, 
Florida Marlins at the time, I believe it was 1997, they were vying to get into the, the playoffs. The coach of the Marlins. The co- he, was, he was coaching the Marlins. He was the manager. He was the manager, yeah. Jim Leland. And it was about August. And his team was right there on the cusp of going to the, to the playoffs. They had enough talent to win a World Series. And Jim saw, for the umpty umpth time, one of his players on a cell phone before the game in the clubhouse. He took that cell phone, threw it against the wall, it smashed into a thousand pieces, and he said, there will be no cell phones in this clubhouse between now and the end of when we win the World Series. Guess who won the World Series that year? The Florida Marlins. Wow. Well, that's how you get people's attention in a clubhouse if they're not concentrating on the task at hand. So whether you're coaching an Islington Middle School team like me, you better pay attention to what we're doing, or you're playing for everything, a World Series and Jim Leland's Marlins, or Cito Gaston's Blue Jays, or John Gibbons' uh, 15 and 16 teams, you have to pay attention and you have to be driven for the right reason, to win. And you need teammates who are going to get into your face and say, play better, let's get it done. Josh Donaldson was that kind of a player right here. Mm -hmm. Dave Winfield and Jack Morris in 92. So it takes a combination of all of that. What what did Winfield and Morris do in 92? Oh, they said, we're here to win. There'll be no fooling around. We're going to have fun, but we're here to do one thing, win. I want you to be dedicated to the job at hand. You go out early, I'll be out there with you. Everything was task-oriented. Wow. They were the leaders. Really, eh? It's funny because, I, of course, I watched that team. I grew up in that, that. Even just that illumination now is was not that, like, I remember Winfield wants noise. And he even told the fans what to do. He's like, we want more noise in the stadium. He wants any. And the people started bringing the signs saying Winfield wants noise. Like, he, yeah, it's interesting. You see that kind of leadership. You have to step out. And you have to be right. I mean, he could have been a leader that was wrong or that was not well, doing it the right way. Like you have to, you have to step out, and also people have to follow you. What if they don't follow you? What if they don't agree with you? That's right. And this gets back to Bobby Knight. He won NCAA championships, and his teams were always vying for those championships because he was the stern taskmaster. Well, no matter what it takes, if you're going to play for Bobby Knight, you know you're there for one reason: to work as hard as you possibly can, put everything into it. And it's like anything else. Unless you put everything into it, you don't know what your capabilities are. And I found that out in high school, too. And when I realized that I could do more, and finally my senior year, I woke up and put time into my academics. That's what made me a better person, a harder worker, a better broadcaster, whatever it happened to be. But you have to come to that realization sometime in your life, no matter what it is, to say, I can do better. Wow, that's beautiful. We've talked a lot about winning here, and I wonder if one, maybe one place we can kind of close things off here is about losing. Because um, I, I love this part of your book, Hello Friends, where you say it was really hard after a game to get a player on the Blue Jays to do an interview because, of course, they just lost the game. So you usually grab a, another player from the other team. But you said Sean Green would always do the interview. And, and I always that jumped out of me in your book because I was like, oh, there's an example. And I remember Sean Green came to my high school, by the way, oh. visited my high school in Whitby, Ontario. And it was a, he was a consummate professional. He was such a gentleman. He stayed really late. He answered all of our questions. My question is, not everything we do in life is going to be a win. Lots of teams that you've watched here have not won. Lots of things I do in my life have, have been losses. I'm trying. We're all trying. How do you lose with integrity and grace what is a better way we can learn to be better losers, knowing that most of the things we try in life are not going to be, we're not going to win at everything. How do we lose better? Well, for me, Neil, it's never about winning or losing. The results are out of your control. But the one thing you can do in anything that you're doing is do your very best. Now, you'll know if you're doing that or not. You can't cheat yourself. You'll know if you're giving half of what you think is your best. But if you give your very best, and all your teammates give their very best. Oftentimes, as I said, you didn't lose, the other team won. So there's a difference. And I think too, the only loser is you when you're not giving your best. And you know when you're sliding and not putting forth the effort. And if you do that your entire life, shame on you. Your life will never be what it should have been having closed out many, many opportunities to do better. So for me, it's not about winning or losing. It's just, did you do your very best? So when you put your head on the pillow at night, you say, Thank you, God. I did my very best. I pushed myself. I enjoyed it. I had fun. I was other directed. And if I'm blessed with tomorrow, let me do that again. Now, for me, that's a life. That's a life worth living. Thank you so much for your time today. You are welcome. Thanks for having me. God bless you. God bless you, too.
Hey everybody, it is just me, it is just Neil again. I'm back at home in my basement with my backpack full of wires, listening back to the conversation at the Sky Dome with Jerry Howarth and reflecting on some of the wise words from this guy in his mid-70s now with so much to give and so much perspective on not just baseball, but life in general. Three quotes that I pulled out from the show are the very last one. The only loser is you if you're not giving your very best. It's not about winning or losing, but did you do your very best? That's a life worth living. I love that story of like the 0-19 basketball team that he saw tremendous growth in, even though the score sheet and the, the record of the team was still zero wins. That was a great example of, did you do your best? That's all you can do. That's all I'm trying to do with this show. I hope that's all you're trying to do in your life. Number two, if you live your life, people will see who you are. Simple. If you live your life, people will see who you are. You don't got to, as he said, you know, wear it on your sleeve. You don't got to tell everyone that you're not going to use the Cleveland or Atlanta baseball team names anymore. You don't have to preach. You can just be yourself and people will get your values and get what you stand for and get your principles from that. I thought that quote was super relieving, you know, because in this world of social media and, and sort of representation and having a smart linked, a smart and spiffy LinkedIn profile, it's like so much of what we're doing now is like trying to tell people who we are and what we stand for and having like one little catchphrase. And as you remember from the conversation in chapter 29 with Michael Harris, what a brand is, is by definition flat and simple. We're brandifying ourselves so much. So Jerry's words are like a bomb on that. You know, if you live your life, people will see who you are. Simple. And number three, related to that, it's not what you coach, it's what you emphasize. This reminds me of uh, Walmart. We always try to study why are some Walmart parking lots full of garbage and other ones are super clean. They both have the same amount of dollars to spend on labor. What's the deal? And we found out that it was just whether or not the Walmart store manager, when they parked their Toyota Tercel on the side parking lot or wherever it was, If they, when they walked to the front door of the Walmart, picked up one piece of trash, that's it. If they did, everybody noticed that, everybody saw that, everybody copied that behavior, and the whole parking lot was clean. It's not what you coach or what you tell people, it's what you do or emphasize yourself. Thank you so much to the incredible Jerry Howarth, who I have been listening to since I was 10 years old. Uh, every single day, well, not every single day, but whenever I would listen to the Jays games, I would listen to Jerry. So it was a pleasure and honor to listen to him. Add to our list of the top 1,000. He gave us number 915, Holy Toledo, Lessons from Bill King, Renaissance Man of the Mic by Ken Korich. Number 914, Morning Has Broken, and that is M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, Morning Has Broken, Love, Loss, and Reclaiming Joy by Aaron Davis. And number 913, Night, My Story by Bobby Knight. And that is K-N-I-G-H-T, Night, My Story by Bobby Knight. Guys, we are getting pretty close to the first 100. We're on an epic quest for 1,000, but we're we're kind of uh, getting pretty close to number 900. I wonder if we should do something. Should we celebrate? What should we do? Give me a call, 1-833-READ-A-LOT, and let me know. But before we get into the phone calls and all the stuff, let me just say a final thank you to Jerry Howard, the people down at the Sky Dome who let us in and were kind enough to like let us sit down there for batting practice. This guy is like the mayor of the Sky Dome. We're walking around. He knows everybody. Everyone wants to shake his hand, take his pictures with him. It was an honor and privilege. Thank you so much to Jerry Howard for Chapter 30 of Three Bucks. And now, here we go in the phone calls. If you are still here, everyone, then it is time for the end of the podcast club. This is the club. This is one of two clubs we have for three books. It's the one where I talk directly to you. You talk directly to me. At the end of every show, you give me a call at one three at one eight three three read a lot, or you leave me a letter somewhere in the form of a review, in the form of a comment, in the form of an email, and we exchange and we read some of them now. Okay. So with that, let's go to the phones. Hi, Neil. It's Danette calling from Oregon, and I'm just checking in to thank you for your podcast. I love it. Um, I found it from another podcast, so it was kind of fun that the technology brought me there, but the big draw was your connection with the moon, um, publishing on lunar um, calendar dates. So um, I always felt a connection with the moon, but it kind of grabbed me in, and then um, I was kind of going back and getting caught up on the episodes, and I finished chapter 23 and 
like my jaw dropped because I had just finished Man's Search for Meaning um, the previous weekend when I listened to it. And it was such a fresh take for me. It was finally something I knew. And it had taken me several months to read that book because I could only read when it was quiet and I could focus. And then like it would expire for my library app and I'd go back on the wait list. And so the timing um, between the moon and then hearing that episode that weekend, it was just amazing. And I just want to thank you for bringing the natural um, into our techie existence. It means a lot. And I'm excited to keep hearing more. Thanks so much. Thank you so much to Annette from Oregon for your phone call. As always, if you want to give me a shout, it's one eight three three read a lot. I love hearing from you. Uh, great synchronicity on man's search for meaning. I love when that happens. You were just reading a book that Jesse Finkelstein talked about in chapter 23. Um, and guys, we're, as I said, we're closing in on the first hundred. We've had two double authors so far, right? We've had Ayn Rand twice. We've had Tom Wolfe twice. Uh, is there an author that you can't believe we haven't discussed yet? You can't believe we don't have a single book by this author. Who is it? Give me a call, one eight three three. You'd read a lot and let me know. And and that, thank you so much for your comments on the lunar calendar. Um, I appreciate that. You know, the Gregorian calendar is 500 years old. The lunar calendar is 30,000 years old. Uh, we can tell the time by looking up into the sky. The Gregorian calendar also has this, this sort of progression baked into it, like I guess life does too. We are always progressing. We, we work up to school, and then we work up to the next grade, and then we work up to the next piece of schooling, and then to the next job, and then to the next promotion, right? It's always like about going upwards, progression. And the calendar, I think, emphasizes and reinforces that. One thing I like about the lunar, and there are many things, but one thing is that it's not a progression. It's rotating. It's cyclical. It's full and then it's new. It's full and then it's new. I find that so relieving in this era of progress to have something that's just rotating, right? Rather than always pushing us to move ahead. I also like the fact that it makes me much more aware of the moon. I can look up to the sky and know when the next chapter of three books is going to drop and know when I have to get down to my basement and record the intro and outro for it. Okay. Okay. What should we do now? Let's go over to the Review of the chapter. Oh, damn, I did it again. I called it a review. It's the letter of the chapter, people. It can come in the form of a review. It can come in the form of a comment, a letter in the mail, an email to me, whatever. This letter comes from Griffin, who left a comment on the YouTube video of chapter 25 of three books with James Fry, author of A Million Little Pieces and many other books. Griffin says, I know this about James. I know he is a joy to listen to. I know he has inspired me. James speaks of how society constrains with its promise of happiness outside the self. He speaks of being poor and working for 12 years when nobody gave a fuck, yet being happy in a small apartment with just a bed and a desk. Being penniless, incredibly happy and deeply content, being a solitary person who is satisfied with self, being fearless after experiencing horrendous hurts. He says, writing books is not hard. It's a privilege. How lucky we are. I am so inspired by James, so happy I find and discover him now at this essential time in my life. Thank you, Neil. Open your door and step outside. Take whatever happens and fall in love with it. Yes. Oh, do listen. Thank you so much to Griffin. And by the way, those last words, opening your door and stepping outside and falling in love with it, come directly from James as he closed off chapter 25. Thank you so much for the letter of the chapter. And now it is time for the word of the chapter. Let's go back to Jerry for this chapter's word. I wanted the crowd to really feel at home. Wow, I'm there. I can feel that crowd, the pandemonium, the excitement, the bedlam. Yes, indeed, it is bedlam, B-E-D-L-A-M. The definition is a scene of uproar and confusion. Synonyms are uproar, pandemonium, commotion, mayhem, confusion. I picked this word because, I mean, I guess I knew what it was, but I didn't know where it came from, and the origin of it is quite interesting. Um, it turns out that it comes from early and middle English. Uh, in, back in London, England, there was a famous hospital called St. Mary of Bethlehem. A thousand years ago, can you, can you imagine trying to manage mental illness without any of the science or awareness that we have of mental illness today? And even today, our, our awareness of mental illness is tiny and puny compared to where it's going, 
but there's, there's no medications, there's no understanding, there's no nomenclature, there's no language. So they put these mentally ill people in one hospital called St. Mary of Bethlehem, and it was used as an institution for the insane, okay? So guess what Bedlam means? It means the scenes outside those hospitals or inside the hospital, a lunatic asylum, a place or situation of madness and chaos. Next time you hear the word Bedlam, Remember that it originated a thousand years ago in London, England, in a mental hospital when it was a scene of madness and chaos. Thank goodness our mental illness awareness and understanding has evolved to where it is, but hopefully it goes way past where we are. We're still just scratching the surface. Bedlam is a good reminder of where we need to go still when it comes to talking more about mental health. Okay. Ah, lots covered there in the end of the podcast club. A great conversation with you and with Jerry, and it's a privilege and honor to be here, here on the floor of my basement with my backpack full of wires in our pilgrimage to uncovering and discussing the 1,000 most formative books in the world. As I often say, this is a huge pleasure. It's a huge honor. It is a gift for me to be able to do this as a project uh, related to art and community and togetherness with no ads and no sponsors and no interruptions and nothing else other than me and you and our guest. So until next time, remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Thanks so much for listening. Keep turning that page and I'll talk to you soon.